So here we go. Tonight we have got the webinar called Food for Thought and we're going to be talking about how diet relates to chronic disease and climate change. So these are two massive areas. So we'll do our best to cover that in about half an hour and then have a good question and answer session. And we're really lucky to have Professor John Potter here as our speaker tonight. So he is an amazing researcher of public health and I'll tell you a little bit more about him shortly. And myself, I'm a pharmacist by background. I've worked in a few hospitals, Wellington, Middlemore and Nelson Hospital. But now I'm spending more time in community pharmacy because my real focus is how we can try and prevent disease and also help look after the environment by helping to people to eat more whole food, plant-based. So, um, yeah, a little bit about me. I've been hosting these webinars this year. We've had one each month. And if you'd like to go back and watch some of the other ones, then there's a whole lot that you can learn. First one was with Dr. Luke Wilson from Wellington. Then we had a dietitian called Emma Strutt. She's from Australia. We had a master chef winner, Aaron Brunet, and he talked about how you can make plant-based food taste amazing. Uh, then we had Dr. Mike Joy, who talked about the environmental impacts of food and what our food system needs to move towards in the future. Uh, we had Ben Eitelberg talking about how you can um, achieve your fitness goals on a plant-based diet. And then last month, we had Chris Hudawai, which took, um, and he talked about Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, and plant-based diet. So there's all sorts of good stuff there if you want to go back and have a look. And that's all on the website, thebetterbase.com. Um, so the Better Base is a platform which has a lot of online resources, but we also do face-to-face -face events. So these are some pictures of some of the events we've done. And um, the bottom right there, that was a panel um, of local Nelson people uh, alongside Dr. Luke Wilson. And we had two screenings of the Big Fat Lion Nelson. And that's where I met Professor John Potter. So he was also on our panel, even though he wasn't in that photo there. Um, and our next event is coming up in Picton on the 28th of August. So if you're around the top of the South Island, then we'd love to see you at that event, 28th of August. Um, this is our website. So jot down the uh, address if you haven't been there before. Um, but tonight we're gonna be focusing on the presentation from John. And then we'll have a question and answer session. So during the presentation, please pop any questions you've got into the chat box. And if you're having trouble opening that up, um, just try and look for the um, little box that says chat and then click on that and you should be able to see it. Um, so I'm gonna say a little bit more about John and his background and was just so excited that he's agreed to join us tonight because he has Got an amazing career and I'm sure we're going to learn a whole lot from him. So he's a professor at Massey University Centre for Public Health Research in Wellington and he's also a senior advisor at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Centre and he's a professor emeritus of epidemiology at the University of Washington and these are both in Seattle in the USA. John's research is focused on nutrition and other environmental and host factors and genetics and the etiology, pathology, and early detection of cancers and other chronic diseases. He's had a whole lot of um, international recognition and awards, and he's also authored or co-authored more than 700 scientific papers, chapters, and books. And his most recent book is called Thought for Food, uh, which was published last year, and it's an awesome read. We'll put up a picture later in the evening, so if you want to have a look at buying that book, then you'll be able to. And he's also more recently um, developed a new focus in Nelson as well. And he describes that he's working with a very fine and growing local group to increase awareness, understanding and adoption of plant-based diets because of their importance in both human and planetary health. So I'm really excited that John lives in Nelson because um, him and I and a number of other local clinicians are starting to meet quite regularly and we're hoping that Nelson becomes a bit of a hot spot for plant-based living. Recently our hospital piloted Meat Free Mondays so yeah watch this space. So without further ado we will start the presentation and I'm going to ask John to turn on his video now and then I'll jump back on in about um, 25 minutes or so 
afterwards and we can start the Q&A discussion. Welcome, John. <laughs> Kia ora. How are you doing? Hello, Hannah. Thank you for the nice introduction. It's all right. I think you're the first Nelson speaker that I've had on here. <laughs> uh, um, and thank you to everyone else for uh, joining us. This is a, uh, a, 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 I haven't worked with one of these before, so um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it works and how it how much feedback we can get and how many questions we can get and so on. But um, it's an exciting opportunity. I usually talk to um, uh, rooms full of students and sometimes rooms full of colleagues, but um, this is a new experience and I'm uh, looking forward to it. Great, all right. So you can share your slides and I will turn off my video now. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, I'm hoping in the next 25 minutes to run through um, some of the issues around diet and its relationship to chronic disease and climate change. Um, we'll move fairly briskly. Uh, as Hannah said, this will go up on, on the website. And so we'll have the opportunity, you'll have the opportunity to come back. And of course, please feel free to ask appropriate questions. I want to start with this knot of intertwined relationships. Um, noting the fact that diet and food choices are clearly implicated in our health. Um, they also obviously uh, influence um, food raising practices. In turn, uh, the food raising practices that we have are now influencing strongly both climate change and what's happening with the environment. Um, and there's a, that's a reverse relationship. There are relationships in both directions there. Our food raising practices clearly determine our food supply and our food supply in turn walks back all the way to our diet and food choices. So, and there's, as you're becoming increasingly aware as we all are, climate change and how environment are important to our health as well. So this is the, the, the picture that I want to start with um, but I'll, I'll try and give you some data on this uh, as we move through. First of all, what causes loss of healthy years in New Zealand? It's neurologic, psychiatric, cardiovascular, it's heart, brain, digestive diseases and musculoskeletal diseases, as well as cancer, account for almost two thirds of all health loss. So these are all chronic diseases. Um, and in turn, these are the risk factors for the chronic diseases. Uh, diet is a key player in, in all of these diseases um, and high body mass index is a key player, alcohol use and low physical activity. All of these are, are important in the diseases that we suffer and a lot of them relate back, as you can see, to the way we live our lives. In fact, uh, a, the, the impact of a high body mass index associated with obesity and overweight is now actually more important as a cause of health loss than tobacco. Tobacco is declining. It's still a major problem um, amongst some groups in our society, um, but it's, it's, it's declining and obesity is becoming more important. The majority of human cancers and other chronic diseases are influenced by food and drink, exercise patterns, body weight, smoking, and our work and workplaces. And some of these habits and exposures are in turn influenced by our culture, our family, our times, but they're also shaped strongly by what foods and drinks are produced, advertised, and sold. Some people make conscious choices about these matters. We already heard from somebody who thought they were the only person who was peddling away towards a whole food, plant-based diet. So some of us make choices about these things. Very often though, we don't examine our habits and we just take them for granted. And perhaps we imagine that the way we eat and drink and live now is the way we always have. So I ask that question and say, is that really true? If you think about our gatherer-hunter past, when we um, were reliant on the environment for all of our food, sugar, salt, fat, meat, and alcohol were all actually 
pretty rare. You had to work for some of them. Some of them didn't exist at all. That was also true for tobacco, for um, poppies, and for a whole series of other drugs. And we've got a taste for all of these. And because they're rare in nature, there have never been deleterious consequences to consumption, even to over sporadic overconsumption. And so we've never evolved natural curves on their overconsumption. When they were rare, it didn't matter if we pegged out. Now it really does. And our response to the rarity, however, once we've established that we didn't have to just gather and hunt, was to cultivate them and keep ourselves in calories and comfort. I'm glossing over a huge amount of history and a lot of change, but our commitment to this approach has led us especially recently to more and more intensity in the way we raise our food. Here's a, a, a small picture of how much things have changed. We raised and consumed modest amounts, and I'm putting up two, meat and sugar. Meat consumption in traditional societies, five to 10 kilograms a year. Most subsistence peasant, act, peasant societies in our world meet once a week, um, more frequently, larger amounts occasionally uh, during festive seasons. Per capita sugar consumption in the UK was around two kilograms a year in 1700. Only the Brits would have data like this. Um, meat consumption in New Zealand, also Australia and the US, is now around 120 kilograms a year, which is a 12 to 24 fold increase in consumption. And we think that's a normal consumption in our society. Per, per capita sugar consumption in New Zealand is around 40 kilograms. Actually, it's probably higher than that now. It's probably closer to 50 um, by now. And again, a 20 to 25 fold increase. These are massive changes in our diet and they've occurred largely in the last uh, 50 to 100 and certainly no more than 200 years. Indeed, our demand and capacity increasingly stretch the boundaries of what's possible and they're deleterious consequences both for the planet and our health. And I'm gonna walk you through three examples. I'm gonna to talk to you about raising cereals first, then sugar, then meat. And I wanna show you that the way we do this is largely in monocultures. Right in the middle of each of these three slides as they come up um, are the, is the main point of the slide. So this one's got cereals, there'll be another one with sugar cane, and there'll be another one with meat. <coughs> On the, in the green text, if you prefer, um, in the teal text, um, the, uh, are the things that we raise these for. And on the, in the white text are the, the, the ways in which we, uh, the inputs, if you like, the human inputs into the raising of these crops. And so one of the things that's happened um, in the UK, for instance, was the way in which, um, first of all, you had enclosures and now prairieization. Australia and, and, the, U and the US are much more uh, spread out with their, um, their food crop raising. But in, in the UK, it was much more closed fields in the original designs. We've increased mechanization, we've increased fossil fuel use, we use pesticides and fertilizers. We've increasingly moving towards uh, genetically modified crops. Um, that's particularly a problem in the US. There's more resistance in Europe and there's resistance in, in New Zealand. And for some reason, um, the resistance might be weakening in some places. We need to think about it. Now, in the orange are the things that come about as a consequence of the way we do monocultures. So here's what happens, we get habitat loss, we get decline in diversity. Mechanization and we get um, climate disruption because of the fossil fuel use, we get a reduction in physical activity and reduction in employment opportunities. Intriguing, we also get an increase in longevity um, because hard working farmers are not quite so battered as they used to be. Pesticides, particularly neonicotinoids are devastating insects everywhere, particularly honeybees. Fertilizers are leading us to soil degradation and the GM varieties are producing all kinds of toxicities that in turn loses beneficial species like butterflies. 
um, herbicide use um, is what supports the GM varieties. And herbicide use is a cause of lymphoma in humans. You also get herbicide resistance, and that means that there's a, a, a vicious cycle because people increase the kind of herbicides and they use more and more and more toxic herbicides. The flour and other food fractions, including corn syrup, particularly corn syrup in the US, leads to obesity and diabetes, and alcohol is associated with chronic diseases, and we'll come back to that in a while. So these are the ways in which we, we raise cereals uh, have all these untoward consequences that you're seeing here in the orange text. Sugar cane, I'll go through this a little quicker. Same, same idea. Um, kidnapping and slavery were really important for the uh, original exploitation of sugar cane, not only in the West Indies, um, but also in Australia. Um, biologic pest control was one of the things that was introduced in Australia that really matters and has interesting effects. Mechanization, fossil fuel use, we're talking about herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. And the, again, we're getting um, habitat loss and decline in diversity. We get unchecked cane toads as a consequence of biologic pest control. For those of you who don't know, who live in New Zealand, cane toads are now past Darwin in the north and headed south to Sydney in the south. Um, and nothing will eat them, nothing will consume them, nothing will defeat them. And then all the consequences of mechanization, herbicide use, particularly mangrove dieback and herbicides. Pesticides have an effect on the reef um, in, in, in Australia particularly, and fertilizers have effects on coral and fish everywhere. Sugar, diabetes, obesity, as well as caries, and again, alcohol, chronic disease of a variety of sorts. Maybe this is a saving grace. Industrial monocultures, the farming practices supposed to be feeding the world, in reality provide less than one third of the world's food. 20% comes from fishing, hunting, and back gardens, and half comes from small mixed traditional farms. I think that's actually really good news um, because we need to backtrack towards some of those practices. The third one, the third monoculture I want to draw your attention to is animals and the number of animals that we raise for meat and eggs and animal fat of various sorts. Massive consumption of water, use of antibiotics and hormones, rainforest destruction, a particular problem we'll see in a moment. Um, human food, ma maize, corn and soy, uh, increasingly used for animal feed. 90% um, of the maize and soy raised in the United States is actually for animals, not for humans. Uh, and then we've got CAFOs, co uh, concentrated animal feeding operations. They're basically concentration camps for animals. In the US, you see up to half a million animals, all in tight packed uh, numbers, and they all are in very close uh, proximity to each other, and it has a huge effect on all sorts of other things that happen. Water, we get aquifer depletion increasingly. Um, we also see um, environmental reproductive effects of hormones. We see antibiotic resistance. We see rainforest destruction resulting in habitat loss and decline in diversity. We get topsoil loss. This is a major problem in lots of parts of the world, including in Australia. Um, and then the animals are producing um, methane and nitrous oxide, methane particularly from bowel, nitrous oxide from urine, and that has major effects on climate, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, meat uh, is, and, and chickens and eggs are, are frequently, and this is a real problem in New Zealand with Pamplobacter, they're frequently uh, contaminated by uh, various unwanted bacteria um, which lead to infection and to toxicity. And then if you say, all right, well, we're going to overcook the meat to get rid of the uh, bugs, what happens is you end up producing carcinogens. So we've got a lot of problems associated with these things, but also associated with CAFOs. CAFOs function like flu factories. They actually allow um, recombination of vaccines. They allow um, animals in such close proximity um, that they produce uh, high risk of spread, particularly from uh, pork and chickens. So um, we, we're likely to see one more not far in the future. 
uh, influenza epidemic that begins in that way. And what do we do? Um, as, a, as a culture, we end up killing things. We either kill them because we think they're going to give TB to our cattle, like badgers in England and bison in the United States, or we're therapeutically and defensively killing them because they're spreading uh, diseases. So we, we have a huge number of problems here um, that are all associated with the very intensive way in which we raise our food. This is the meat consumption pattern of the world since 1960 to about uh, 2015. And you can see that we've gone from about 6 million tons a year consumed to about 30 million. So a five-fold increase in just 50 years. A lot of it associated with, yes, increases in, in China from very low levels to much higher levels. But you can see that the, the North American consumption levels um, have, have climbed steadily in that, in that period as well. Note in India, um, quite low levels, about three kilograms per person per year, um, which is um, a much more like the sort of, and this is because of course, about 800 million people in India don't eat meat at all. These are the greenhouse gases we see, and they have a massive effect. Methane is 86 times more uh, potent as a greenhouse gas um, in the first 20 years of its existence. And methane is a major output from cattle. Um, and raising animals is now a huge contributor um, to the world's uh, global climate change and particularly to um, the way in which our temperatures are rising. To give you an idea of how land is used, and this is a, a United States map, US Department of Agriculture map, and each of those squares is 100,000 hectares. And you can see that a dominant uh, color in there is the yellow, which is, which is pasture uh, for, for animals. Um, and the, um, the, the brown stuff is cropland. And you can see a lot of the Midwest is used for raising crops. Now, when you, when you condense all this into a single block, you see that animal raising accounts for about 41% of mainland US land use. Its pasture is, is 265 million hectares and raising maize and um, soybeans accounts for about uh, 52 million hectares. Huge amount of, of the land mass of a single country used to raise animals. And you can see here, here's what's happened in South America. They weren't growing soy at all until the 90s and they now export 40 million tons of soy to China to support livestock. And this is one of the health consequences of the way in which we pre prepare meat. I'm, I'm not gonna give you all the data. There's associated data for red meat as well, but this is the processed meat intake and you can see the higher the intake, the higher the risk of colorectal cancer and the higher the risk of cardiovascular disease. And we uh, are major consumers and we have a major problem in New Zealand with colorectal cancer and with heart disease. Switch to sugar, higher consumption of sugar and sugar containing foods, particularly sugar sweetened beverages associated with dental caries in kids, particularly but adults as well, type two diabetes, higher energy intake associated with weight gain and increases in body mass. Um, this is just uh, a small moment of levity here um, that you might want to think about because this is all pretty depressing stuff. Um, New Zealand has the third highest obesity rate in the OECD and you can see how much it's climbed in, in just um, those few years from 1977 to 2012. We now have 1.2 million adults, which is 32% of the population, obese, up from 29% in 2011. And nearly 100,000 children aged 2 to 14 are obese. And you can see that that's gone up from 8.4 to 10.7, and now 12.3% of these kids. Children living in the most socioeconomically deprived neighborhoods were 2.5 times as likely to be obese as children living in the least deprived neighborhoods. So we know who's at risk um, and we have ways of dealing with it, but we don't deal with it. 
after not smoking, being a healthy weight is the most important way you can protect yourself against cancer. Strong evidence that being overweight or obese is a cause of 12 different cancers. Um, and you can read them for yourselves, which ones. But particularly bowel and breast are really important in New Zealand. Um, as, but, but pancreas and ovary cancer and particularly advanced prostate cancer is also a serious issue in New Zealand, as is cancer of the uterus. And here's the disease burden associated with alcohol. It has a causal impact on, indirectly or directly, tuberculosis, cancer, 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 diabetes, alcohol use disorders, fairly obviously, as well as depression, epilepsy, heart disease, stroke, heart rhythm disorders, pneumonia, cirrhosis, all of the flu term, birth complications, and fetal alcohol syndrome. But all we can remember is that it's good for the heart. It turns out that's not even true. Um, if you look at, this is the paper that was just published last year in The Lancet. Globally, alcohol is the seventh leading risk factor for deaths and loss of healthy years, counting for more than 2% of female deaths and uh, nearly 7% of male deaths. And notice for those 15 to 49, leading risk factor accounting for nearly 4% of female deaths and 12% of males. And those 15 to 49, the three leading causes of death, tuberculosis, road injuries, and self-harm. Really important consequences of our addiction to alcohol. For those aged more than 50, 27% of total alcohol attributable to female deaths and nearly 19% of male deaths. And the level of alcohol that minimizes harm across all health outcomes is actually zero. The conclusion from the Lancet authors was alcohol use is a leading risk factor. It's risk of all cause mortality and of cancer specifically rise with increasing levels. And the level of consumption that minimizes health loss is zero. So we really have to think about what we're doing with New Zealand's alcohol control policy. If you think about it, our ancestors never drank alcohol at all until, until we settled down into agricultural communities there was no alcohol on the menu at all. The climate change health consequences. Primary, secondary, tertiary. This is from my friend Colin Butler. Heat, stress and trauma from fire and flood and suicide are all associated with primary changes in temperature. Secondary ones, you get shifts in disease vectors and we saw that with Zika just recently. But there are all sorts of other things going on with disease vectors and intermediate hosts and pathogens that are changing and they're changing rapidly. And then tertiary, and we're seeing this too, because the Prime Minister was talking about this just today, uh, the likelihood of di displacement associated with uh, rising sea levels, and we are seeing already famine and conflict in the Middle East that are closely related to climate change. Ambient temperature is associated with depression and suicide. Um, studies done in both um, US and Mexico and for a one degree rise in, in monthly average temperature, you see an increase in suicide in both the US and in Mexico. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you started with a hot, hotter or cooler region, it's, it, it's the rise in temperature that really matters. So there's this knot of intertwined relationships that we've talked about. We haven't talked about it in a huge amount of detail, but we've talked about a lot of these in, we've touched on a lot of it. The last question I want, want to ask you is, is this question. How much is climate change shifting the food supply? And that turns out to be an important question. What is the climate change doing to the food supply? This is a massive database of wheat price since the 13th century, um, produced by Max Rosa. <clears throat> and you can see that through the centuries, wheat price has been quite unstable. Um, and was rising up until about um, 1820, 1830, and then began to fall as, as stabilizing systems were put in place and particularly raising monocrops. Um, and so you've seen a you see a decline from um, midway through the, the 19th century um, all the way through the 20th century, essentially to the end. Um, but what's happening recently, we're seeing 
food shocks, we're seeing changes in the availability of food associated with wheat, particularly in various places. And these are climate induced shocks to some extent, but we're also seeing it in US maize, we're seeing it in Argentina. Um, and the, the food prices are beginning to become unstable. All of you have noticed that sometimes prices rise very rapidly. Here's the contrasting time series of what's been happening in Australia. Between 1900 and about 1990, the yields were steadily increasing across the country. Um, and you see variation year to year, but a steady rise um, in productivity of wheat. But since 1990, productivity has absolutely flattened. Um, so given that the world is going to need um, a huge amount more food between now and 2050, um, what's the, the serious question that these particular researchers ask themselves is, can technology continue to maintain current years, let alone increase them to those that we're going to need by 2050? And that picture in Australia can be replicated in a whole lot of places all over the world. We've only ever got a few months of the world's grain supplies available in storage. Two other human staples are also under stress. Maize is increasingly under threat as temperatures rise, and rice in some contrast is under threat from rising levels of CO2. Vegetable and legume production will suffer as a consequence of rising temperature, declining water supply and salinity. Although rising CO2 concentrations initially anyway will boost production, but overall a reduction, and it's likely that this is gonna have a major effect on uh, affordability, availability and consumption. Um, and then there's what's happening in our coastal lands. Seagrass is declining in New Zealand, although we have seen it once before do this. Grass barrier reef is seeing massive amounts of bleaching because of temperature. Mangroves inundation um, in the northern Australia, but also across the Indo-Pacific. Kelp forest loss in Western Australia. And they're all, among many other roles, nurseries for fish and marine invertebrates. This does not bode well for the medium term even, um, especially when combined with overfishing in relation to food, fish supplies. And then finally, last, essentially the last data slide, you can see here, this is a, a paper just published this year showing how increasingly unstable, these are food shocks. What that means is unexpected um, declines in production. And the red line is showing you, the spikes are showing you um, the, the frequency of shocks. Um, and you can see that they're becoming more frequent over time uh, in crops, in livestock, in fisheries, and even in agri agriculture. So we are, what is, what is climate change doing to food, raising in the food supply? It's starting to make our food supply more uncertain. One more reason to think seriously about how we should respond to climate change. And one more reason to think seriously about how to to consume a plant-based diet. If you want to know more about some of these things, um, this is a, a book that was published last year, um, Thought for Food, published by Bridget Williams, um, a really wonderful uh, New Zealand publisher, um, and it's uh, available both online and, and in print form if you're interested. So, Charles Darwin, final paragraph of Origin of Species said this, it is interesting to contemplate a tangled bank clothed in many plants, many, many plants of many kinds, with birds singing in the bushes, various insects flitting about and with worms crawling through the dark air, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and, and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. We seem increasingly to find ways to mock those laws, but I think we do it in growing peril to ourselves and the planet. And that is my closing thought. Hannah, I'll hand back to you and we'll be happy to respond to questions if there are any. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, John. 
a lot of information and research and data presented there. So I think I'm going to have to go back and have another watch of it. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of really important messages that I think all of New Zealand needs to hear and all of our leaders need to hear as well. So my first question is, what do you think needs to happen for us to you know, get to a state where our food systems are sustainable and healthy? I, I wish there was a simple process. I mean, one of the things that, that you know, because we've been talking about this, um, we have a lot of people who are involved in raising food in New Zealand, the rest of the world too, but let's think about New Zealand. And, and most of these people are, are, are doing food raising because it's been in the family and, and they regard it as a, very often as a calling, as a, they, they feel like it's the very best thing that they can be doing with their time. And their livelihoods depend on it and the livelihoods of their families depend on it. So if we are going to see a decline as we, as we desperately need to in meat consumption and milk consumption, um, we need to we need to get um, into a state where we can have conversations with the folks who are doing the food raising and begin to think about alternatives that must be in place. As individuals, we can choose. And as we walk through the, the supermarket or the organic store or the, or the, the farmer's market or wherever we shop, um, we can choose the, the foods. But if we are going to change the supply of foods, then we really have to begin to think about how do we get people to transition and how do we do it without tearing their lives apart? Mm -hmm. And that's not a simple problem. Um, and, it's, and it's one we, we have to have serious compassion about because although those of us who've made choices about not eating meat or not, um, not consuming dairy or whatever it is that we've made, um, we can do that as individuals, but if we're going to change the whole system, it's got to work for the folks who are the food producers, and, and that's not an easy choice. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a role for the government to play here, and there'll be some interesting conversations about you know how that happens. Um, last week, or the week before, the government put out a report called Sustainability in the Health Sector, and it was encouraging hospitals to... And, yeah. and health organisations to be reducing meat and dairy. Um, and how would you suggest that, say, a hospital or a medical centre could go about implementing those recommendations? Well, one of the important things in this is, again, um, talking to the people. Um, you have to have the folks on site. Um, and the folks who work in the hospital, whether they're they're working, selling or preparing food, whether they're working as nursing staff or medical staff, or they're working as support staff, or they're um, involved in, in the, the role of dietitians. Um, all of them have to at least hear why some of these changes need to be made. So that's the first thing is, is those sorts of conversations. But there are some things that, that we can do. And indeed, as I think we, we, uh, we, can, we can discuss, um, the, the, the Nelson Marlborough um, Hospital um, DHB um, actually went for, at least the, the Nelson Hospital anyway, went for Meat Free Mondays. Um, it's a start. It's a, it's a way of getting people to start thinking, why are these folks doing this without being a, a dreadful uh, impact of their lives? You still might have some people worrying about whether they can have their meat on Monday or not. But um, it begins the, that conversation. Um, that was a really important step, and uh, Rob Bigglehole was really important in getting that role. I think he's one of our um, really strong colleagues here in this, in this area. Um, the, 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 a couple of easy steps, um, I think, if, if we have the dietitians on site, is they spend time. It, well, when you've got someone who's a smoker and they have a heart attack, that's a really good time to help them get off smoke, get off their tobacco. They, they, they're much happier um, realizing that this is, this is a good time. We could, we could do the same thing with dying. If you're in hospital with diabetes or you've got problems with obesity or you're, you're just suffering from a heart attack, um, this is a good time. 
for the dietitians to work with those folks and, and reduce their meat consumption. Um, actually leave the hospital with some ways of actually doing that. Um, and then um, the, 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 the final thought is um, given that uh, processed meat is a, is a class one carcinogen, we could just simply stop having that on the menu, whether it's for staff or for patients. It just simply shouldn't be on the, on the menu. It's a class one carcinogen. It's the same group of carcinogens as, as tobacco and alcohol and asbestos, um, not for human consumption. Yeah. So we know it's quite clear that processed meats are linked to causing cancer and red meats are likely to be linked to causing cancer. What would you say about other chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease? Um, how strongly linked are animal products to? Clearly, they're, they're clearly related. Um, and, and they're clearly related probably by multiple mechanisms. Um, and the mechanisms might involve um, gaining weight, which increases your risk of obesity. Meat is, a, is because of the amount of meat. I mean, if you think about, if you think we're now eating 10 to 20 times more meat than we used to, and we're eating 10 to 20 times more sugar than we used to, it's, it's not surprising that we've got a problem with obesity um, because humans weren't built to, to consume this level of, of uh, high density calories, high calorie density food. We really need to um, get the, that, that consumption back into some sort of sensible level. Yeah. And so, yes, the heart disease, hypertension, stroke, uh, diabetes, um, a whole bunch of cancers all related to, to, to meat, meat, sugar and alcohol. They're, they're, the, they're the key players here. For sure. And if anyone hasn't seen the Adventist health studies, they show quite nicely the stepwise reduction in both diabetes incidence and obesity as you move from a, an omnivore diet through to vegetarian um, and then through to a vegan diet. So that's a good one to look for. And another good resource if anyone's wanting to learn more about any particular disease is the Plant-Based Health Australia website. So that's um, created by a doctor and a nutritionist in Australia. Um, there's a question here from Susan who says, clearly we don't have the dietitians on our side after last week's press release. What was up with that? Well, um, you know, part of it, part of, partly it's their training. Um, they, uh, there's still some archaic ideas about nutrition around. Um, and you know, when, when people um, were, had, had poor quality diets, the, the, the addition of meat um, probably meant uh, an improvement um, at some points um, in, their, in their diets. And so that's kind of hung over. Um, and so we've got this notion that protein is good for you, so more protein must be better for you. Um, and of course, like everything else, uh, some's good, more's better, doesn't work very well. Um, and in fact, uh, meat consumption is a real problem. They also have a serious conflict of interest. I mean, they are, they are supported by beef and lamb, they're supported by um, other uh, industry um, benefactors. Um, and, and, and it would be a really good idea for them to cut themselves free. In fact, our, our, our whole nutrition infrastructure, our professional nutrition infrastructure in a lot of places is supported by meat raisers, and alcohol producers and sugar producers and so on. Um, and you know, they, they know they want to convince the, the folks to sell their, their product. We don't, need, we don't need that product, we really don't. Mm, that's right. And I hear that there might be a professor in New Zealand who's written a response to them that might get published in a popular paper sometime soon. So. You never know your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Karen is asking, what are examples of perfect foods for human consumption? Um, I, I, I'm perfect foods. I, it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, there probably are no perfect foods, but there is a there are really good food eating patterns, um, and and what 
the patterns are, are of the sort that say um, consumption in relatively small quantities mostly of a wide, wide variety of plant products, whether it's out of the ground or it's off the bush or it's um, off the tree um, or it's raised as a crop um, and as, as close to as, the, as fresh as you can make it, make your food from fresh ingredients if you can, um, make them from, uh, by fresh I, I mean, you know, not stuff that's been hanging around either, um, but literally fresh. If you can grow some of your own, fine. If you've got a farmer's market, fine. Um, the, 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 the people will, will choose to consume other, um, other foods and in other forms. And, and indeed, plant foods, almost any form, I and mean, even if it's frozen or, or canned, it's, um, it's better than uh, not eating enough vegetables and fruit. Vegetables and fruit are really important, but so are nuts and seeds and grains. Um, and it's really important to get a whole bunch of herbs in there. Um, and fermented foods are probably really important too, because they replenish the bugs in our gut. Um, so there are a lot of, it's a spectrum of things. And there are no superfoods. I spend a whole section of my little book. There are no superfoods. There are certainly infrafoods, but there are no superfoods. Great. Um, so Holly's asking for someone wanting to cut back on red meat and dairy, are fish and chicken better or safer alternatives while adjusting to removing red and processed meat? I, if you had asked that question 50 years ago, I think I'd have said yes. Now I'm going to be a little more cagey. And the, the reason is, is this. Um, our fish supply is heavily contaminated by heavy metals, particularly by mercury. Um, and we, so we've got a problem with that. Um, and, and our chickens are often um, polluted quite a lot with Campylobacter. Uh, and in some countries, although I, I, I'm actually not familiar with entirely with all of the New Zealand practices, but um, hormones are sometimes used in, in raising animals as well. So yes, you are probably better um, coming down off uh, red meat into, um, um, into, into fish and chicken, but I'd, I'd rush through the fish and chicken pretty fast if you want to do that, um, because the reality is that um, and for some health conditions, they are better for you, but overall, um, and for the planet, probably not. Yeah, I'm just going to um, share a slide now, which is relevant. Um, so this is recent research from Otago University. Um, so if people are thinking of, you know, replacing some of their meat meals with vegetarian meals and um, perhaps going more into the reducitarian type category that a lot of people are doing. Uh, this shows how your daily diet related emissions reduce as you move away from animal products. So on the left hand side, we've got the typical New Zealand diet. If we even just move to the dietary guidelines, we'd save a little bit of carbon. So that's just conforming with the current guidelines. If we introduce one weekly plant-based meal, then we're saving about 7% of emissions. And then if we, um, like Holly suggested, replace beef and lamb with poultry or pork, um, then we're starting to move down a little bit more. Pescatarian, um, even more. And you can see as you go further towards um, vegan, on this end, you can save about a third of your diet related emissions. So yeah, any, any step is good. So any thanks. step is good. Yeah, that's a really important consideration. Uh, you shouldn't ever um, you shouldn't ever imagine that taking one step is 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 a silly thing. It, it, as long as it's headed in the right direction, it's it's a good thing to do. Yeah, for sure. And that research was by Anna DeMello and John O'Drew, who are down at Otago University. And they're planning on publishing more of a 
Thara article, which has also got a tool that hospitals could use to assess different um, hospital menus and how climate friendly they would be. So we're really excited to see that coming out. Um, so we've got a question, I think this is Jared here. Um, how can the average New Zealander break free from, <laughs> from the society, social systems ingrained in our culture that kept us chained in these addictive habits that cause these diseases and the environmental impacts? I think there's a, you know, I, I have, have been on um, what, uh, I, I began as a lacto vegetarian about 45 years ago. Um, I, I can tell you that there was much more of a struggle um, then because people thought you were really weird um, and they couldn't imagine why anyone would want to do that. Um, it's it's got a lot easier. It's much more socially acceptable. It's much. It's your friends are not going to be. Um, they they might think you're a bit weird, but but they'll put up with it. Um, and and you you know you'll find lots of alternatives. You'll be able to go and get the foods in in the market or your supermarket or your farmers market. The the food is available. The social acceptance is rising. Um, the, the problems are much lower than they used to be and the gains are probably more desperately needed so the changes are more desperately needed. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think any uh, reasons you want to give yourself for not doing it may be uh, not as good as they used to be. Um, I, would, I would just take that one step and then the next step and then the following step as best you can. Yeah, I find often, you know, often people when they decide to start eating more vegetarian meals, and, and perhaps it's worse for males, you know, the, the jokes come, but they get old pretty fast. And I think, you know, for the first few weeks, um, maybe you'll be hassled a bit, but then people just get used to it. And then often you'll be out for a meal, you'll get yours, and everyone else looks at it and gets jealous because it looks better than anything else on the table. <laughs> so... True. Yeah, it is ha the change is happening incredibly fast. Um, got a question from Heike. How do you suggest we can grow large amounts of food in a diverse ecosystem? I understand that farming has gone to monocultural crops and they often use a lot of chemicals so they can produce huge fields of monocrops. Mm, it's true. Um, you know, one of the things that really cheered me up, the, the New Zealand Film Festival is on at the moment, and there's a, there's a film um, which has been showed up, shown here, anyway, in Nelson, I think just twice, um, called The Biggest Little Farm. And it's, it's about an eight year experiment on turning um, barren Californian uh, ground at, at a place called Moore Park in, 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 North, in not far from Los Angeles. Um, into uh, uh, an incredibly productive, diverse. They, they were not intending, they, they had no intention of being vegetarians and they're not. It, they raise sheep and cattle and all sorts of stuff. But it's the most extraordinary um, evidence on, uh, of, of change that you can bring about in the environment. Um, and they, they farmed 200 acres and they turned it into an extraordinarily diverse ecosystem that involved both the plants and animals that they introduced, but a lot of wildlife that came back um, to inhabit what they had created, um, sometimes to their detriment, sometimes to their benefit. Um, there are ways of getting there, but it, it's going to require a lot of different kind of knowledge about food raising, but it's the kind of knowledge that exists um, in, uh, in indigenous cultures, um, and, and certainly amongst small uh, mixed farming families uh, that go back generations. That information is available. It may be just available in books to some of us, but it is available and it can be done. Mm -hmm. I agree. It seems like we're at a point now where, you know, we could take two paths and, you know, one path is going in a direction that, you know, things are getting worse and it looks like a planet that we don't want to live on, but the other direction could be an amazing place where we've got all of these beautiful food forests and 
and the future is looking good. So hopefully as a society, we can do what we need to, to take that path. Nice. Um, we've got a couple more questions. So if you're all right, John, we'll keep going for a few more minutes past nine o'clock. No problem. Um, so Susan is asking, in the plant-based world, are we talking enough about salt intake given the recent global, global burden of disease study and the breakdown of key nutritional risk factors? Or is the added potassium from vegetables helping to counterbalance the average sodium intake? It, it does a little, um, but, but in fact, we do consume a lot more salt than we need. Um, and it, here's the interesting thing about giving up both salt and sugar. Um, when you first decide that you're not going to sprinkle sugar, uh, salt on anything, um, the, the food tastes bland and difficult and problematic. And then um, a couple of weeks go by and certainly by the end of a month, um, somebody puts too much salt on your food and you think, oh, that really tastes bad. Exactly the same thing happens with sugar. If you start, um, if you reduce the sugar in your coffee and tea, um, at first of all, it just tastes weird. And then two weeks later, um, you're thinking, why would I put sugar in this? Um, we can change our, our taste habits fairly fast if we're disciplined about that change. And I think um, and reduction in salt, not everybody is salt sensitive, but some people are salt sensitive and when they are, they get hypertension. Um, so, and high blood pressure is, a, is, is not a nice condition to live with. Uh, there are other causes of hypertension and particularly uh, being overweight um, is, a, is another one and so is consumption of alcohol. But salt is a contributor for those who are salt sensitive and, and reducing the amount of salt. Use other herbs as well as, as yes, you've got vegetables with potassium, but use herbs and spices um, to, to flavor foods as well. Um, it's, it's a remarkably uh, useful addition and you get other, other different um, sm small amounts of other different compounds, phytoactive compounds that are actually beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Probably a good point to say, if anyone is planning on making any dietary changes as a result of this, if you have any health conditions or are on medicine, then definitely have a chat with your doctor before doing so, because some of these changes can have a really powerful effect. And if you're on blood pressure medicines and start eating you know, lower salt and healthy diet, then you might end up getting low blood pressure. The same can go for blood sugar if you're on insulin. Um, and if you're on any other medications, it's definitely best to check with your doctor before making any big changes. Yeah, and, be, and stay monitored for a while as you make the changes. Yes, that's the one. Um, Linda's asking, can we please explain why a vegan diet is best for MS? Do you know much about MS, John? I, I do know a little about MS. I don't know that there's really strong evidence that vegan diets are, are better for MS. It wouldn't surprise me, but I don't know the data. Yeah, I'd recommend uh, getting in touch with Dr. Mark Cray, who's a GP in Auckland. And I know he's presented evidence about MS and um, there's been quite a series of case studies about people who have improved, but. I don't um, think there's been, been trials that, that would, would help us, but, but you know, enough case studies and it, it, that's a, a useful thing to do. And as we don't know an awful lot about, we, we know a lot about MS and its pathology, but we don't know a lot about how to deal with it. Yeah. People just um, basically get monitored and supported. Um, so if it turns out to be beneficial, um, that's one more benefit to yeah. the individual. Yeah. Um, Emma Strutt, who's a dietitian, has just said Code Blue is a great documentary about whole food plant-based diet and MS. And it's actually, um, the documentary is hosted by an American doctor. So it's okay. a good one to watch. Um, Jennifer's saying, my uncle recently had a very minor stroke and she's been trying to get him to watch Forks Over Knives, but no luck so far. He's a country calendar nut, traditional meat and three veg sort. Any tips or helpful info relating to strokes and prevention in that area? Um, it's, 
it's usually a good time, as I said before, about people recovering from chronic um, or acute disorders. It can be a good time to change their diets. Um, but they, people can also feel put upon. So you have to just be very supportive. Um, and if you can introduce an idea um, gently, um, then do so. Um, but don't, don't make it a, a, a rod to beat someone with um, because they're trying to recover. Um, it's, it's important to be, try and be wherever they are and, and ask them, one, one good question is, what would convince, ask them, what would convince you that this might actually be beneficial? What, what, what evidence would you like? What information would you like in order to make this work for you? Um, and, and then you're putting the onus back on them in a way to say, well, have you got any information? And then you can introduce um, a film or a book or, a, or just, hey, why don't you try this? This is a really interesting recipe, but you know, whatever. I mean, there's a, there are ways in here, but they can't be rude or rough. Yeah, I would totally agree. Sometimes find that the more gentle you are, or even, you know, holding back, the more people will ask questions. And, and I think cooking for people as well, if they can see that it tastes just as good as what they used to eat and they know how to prepare it, then often that helps. Yeah. Uh, Leslie's asking, do you know if there's any benefit for Parkinson's disease, plant-based eating? There's some new and interesting and important information emerging about Parkinson's. It's a, not a disease that we understood very well, but there's some really good information that's emerging now that suggests that, that it begins in the gut and it begins uh, particularly in, in and around the appendix um, where various um, different bugs come to live and then they start to signal oddly to the brain. Um, if we understood that better, we might be able to change it. Um, but, but getting your, your gut bugs in, in better order um, is, may well be helpful. And one of the things that really screws up gut bugs is a diet that's high in meat protein, that's high in sugar, and that's high in alcohol. They all disrupt the gut bugs a lot. Um, eating a plant-based whole food diet um, with, uh, with some fermented products. Um, you, you can, you know, I, obviously fermented products began as, as the way to get through um, the winters, right? You, 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 you pickled your cabbage and, you, and, and people did this all over the world. Um, and you, and you saved various um, kinds of foods by, by fermenting them and, and stopping them from becoming uh, completely rotten. Um, but, but we can take benefit from, from some of those fermented foods and use them because they feed our gut bugs as well. Um, so there are probably some uh, ways in which we could get to solve some problems with Parkinson's, but I don't know that that's actually been done yet. I just I'm just going on some very recent information and putting it together with the, the need to maintain good gut bugs. Great. Um, got someone asking, any thoughts on plant-based eating for children? Yes, do it. Do it. <laughs> just, um, you know, there are, a lot of kids will, will turn out to be natural vegetarians or vegans. Um, given given a choice, they, they won't want to eat the animals. Um, and some kids are very vocal about it. Um, but you can raise um, you can raise very very healthy children on uh, vegan or vegetarian diets. Uh, you have to you, you can't be a junk food vegan diet. It can't be a junk food vegetarian diet. It has to be whole foods. It has to be um, a lot of fresh food. It has to have a lot of care in it. Um, but it's, it's, it's eminently doable. Mm -hmm. And I'd add that the important thing is making sure they're getting enough calories in and enough energy. So yep. often people find if they're moving 
because plants, they need to eat more to get the same amount of calories, which for adults is usually a good thing, but children might just need to make sure that they're you know, getting enough snacks if they're not eating big quantities at their main meals. Um, smoothies is another way to get um, energy in quickly <laughs> and nuts and seeds. Um, also B12 supplementation. So alongside the foods, B12 is the one thing that we would recommend taking a supplement for because it's not found in plant foods. You want to say any more about that, John? Yeah, I, actually the, our oral bugs make B12 and we have bugs in our rectum that make B12. The problem is that we often don't absorb it. Um, but it's, um, it is there and we only need tiny amounts. Um, the, one of the very oldest studies on vegetarians, um, people who haven't eaten, uh, vegans actually, who haven't eaten any, any uh, animal products for a long time, and uh, they fell into three groups. One, were, one third was B12 sufficient, one third was B12 marginal, and the third group was B12 deficient. And the problem is we don't know who's who. Um, ahead of time, um, which is why you might want to recommend a B12 supplement if you're consuming uh, a purely vegan diet. Um, if you go with children to um, a lacto-vegetarian diet as, as one step that you might want to take, then you're less problematic with the B12. Okay, great. Um, so last question. How can a vegan daylight be tailored to aid recovery from mild to severe ME or chronic fatigue syndrome? I don't know any data that, that convinced me, um, but um, it would not surprise me if it were not beneficial. Um, I, I don't know any data. Do you know some data here on that? Not aware of anything, no. no. You can experiment. Experiments of one um, are really useful, uh, particularly if the one happens to be you. Um, it, yeah. you know, sometimes you just go and try stuff and, and see whether it helps you. Yeah. Maybe. Nutritionfacts.org is a good website for searching particular conditions. So um, if you wanted to head there, there's videos and um, reference transcripts on all sorts of conditions. So that's nutritionfacts.org. Um, there's one last comment. I've heard mushrooms have got B12. Is that correct or not? Uh, no. There, <laughs> there, there, are some, there, there are some plant sources. Um, there, there's a sea vegetable that produces some B12, I think, but it's not one that we've got readily available. Um, it basically, no, it's an animal product. Basically, we get it from, from animal products. So it's, it, or, or we get it, as I said, we do have some bugs on board. It just, it's just a bit marginal to get a hold of it. Great. Um, just going to put my screen sharing back on and show you a couple of final slides. Um, so a few would like to continue um, to see those webinars happening, then there's a Patreon available. So that's the link there. And I'm really grateful to um, about a dozen people that are helping support these webinars to continue. Uh, this is the uh, website if you're interested in some more recipes. So thebetterbase.com, you can go and find some recipes if you're interested in starting to eat more of a plant-based diet. Um, and you can also Follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and there's the website again. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to everybody that has joined on today. And we've got some really good questions coming through. Hopefully it was helpful uh, for those of you who had particular um, health or environmental questions that you were asking about. Um, and of course, John, thank you so much for your time tonight. And your knowledge is just immense, and I hope this is the first of um, many occasions where you can come on and you know, share what you know with a, a big audience. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you know, how we can take these ideas forward, move towards a healthier population in New Zealand and also healthier environment. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you everybody else that's been a, 
very nice evening.